much. It's 6.01 and I would like to call to order the February 15th Concord Carlisle Regional School Committee meeting. And I'll call to order the Concord School Committee meeting. And we have a roll call. Anderson present. Present. Marana present. Rainey present. We're alphabetical. I, I got that. Rankin present. <laughs> Wilson present. Eva? Eva, are you present? <laughs> You're on mute. Oh. All right. And I just want to briefly welcome Carrie Rankin to the screen tonight and in person next time we meet. And, um, and we'll have more of a proper introduction for you when we get back to the full public meeting. Um, but for now, I think I'll take a motion to uh, move to executive mm -hmm. session. Should anyone care to make such a motion? I'll be happy to. Uh, the Concord School Committee and the Concord Carlisle School Committee will enter into an executive session under purpose three of the open meeting law to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the CCHS tutors and CPS CCHS bus drivers union and litigation regarding the EDCO collaborative and return to open session at 6.30 p.m. Is there a second? When you're done voting, I just wanna note we're closing this whole Zoom down for a different process tonight. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll second it. Okay. Discussion? Other than we will be closing this uh, whole Zoom down and returning here at 6.30 for any members of the public. And I'm just going to note that before we get on to the rest of our agenda, we do, we do have the public, we have the public hearing on school choice um, before public comments time. But there are public comments in the hearing as well. So. Okay, roll call. Anderson, I. Who's I? Marana, I. Mustafi, I. Rainy, I. Can I have a quick question? Where is the second link? I'll That's send it to Lori's calendar invite. Okay. Oh. I think that Aaron yeah. sent them both out today, didn't she? Okay. Yeah, they should be in an email too. Yep, I think. Okay, I think I see it. Okay, yep, I got it. Okay. Great. Okay. okay. Were we? Rank and I. Wilson and I. For region. Okay. All right. Hi. See you all over there. Okay. Hi, Harry. Hi, Darcy. Thank you for joining us. We have two. Can we announce that we're being recorded? Yeah. All right. We're all here. Uh, 
Welcome back to the February 15th, the joint Concord Carlisle Concord School Committee's meeting. Um, before we begin with our hearing on school choice, I think, um, Court, can you lead us in a moment of recognition and for, uh, for Peter Nichols? Yes, I will. Thank you. We have lost a member of the CCHS family, and we note with great sadness the pa passing of a beloved teacher, Peter Nickel. Concord Carlisle and Boston students were graced with his gifted teaching and his inspiration, and they joined his work colleagues and us here tonight in recognizing this loss. And the gift of his life and his choice to live and to teach among us. How is it that Peter Nickel was so awesome and, and also so unassuming? Well, those were the words that came up for me, awesome and, and unassuming. And so I had to stop and ponder, how could that be so? And awesome because of the way he lived his life what he chose to do. And I think, and he's not here to ask, unassuming in his unique way because he was trying to tell us something. He was trying to tell us that there's room for all of us to, to live in harmony. He was a man of rare qualities, so worldly, but also so rooted in this place. Well, he lived life fully, he was taken too early after his valiant struggle with a brain tumor. Our hearts go out to his wife, Leslie, his children, Aiden and Ella and Isa, and we wish them strength and fortitude. To his students and colleagues, who were taught and up, uplifted by Peter, we extend our deep sympathy. His love of family and community was boundless and it embraced all of us. For the lessons and inspiration Peter shared with us about how to fully engage with life's opportunities and how and why we must recognize our responsibility as stewards of a planet in peril, we give thanks to him for a life magnificently lived. All have been invited and welcomed to celebrate Peter Nichols' life with his family at First Parish on March 5th at 1 p.m. I looked for some words that might speak to and for Peter and E.B. White came up. I don't know if E.B. White was uh, uh, something, uh, an author that Peter was fond of, but I would guess so. White writes, if the world were merely seductive, that would be easy. If it were merely challenging, that would be no problem. But I arise in the morning torn between a desire to improve or save the world and a desire to enjoy or savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. Well, we're very fortunate that Peter Nichol was a person who planned magnificently and both helped us save the world and enjoyed it immensely. We're fortunate he was among us. We'll miss him greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Court. Okay moment just reflect
I think that that's the first, but I, not the last time. I think that we will recognize his contributions to the school um, here and in other venues uh, to the community overall. Um, okay, so on to, on to the business. Um, uh, I'd like to, I'll be presiding over this public hearing today on uh, school choice participation for Concord Carlisle, uh, districts. The purpose of this public hearing is to invite comments from members of the public regarding school choice, the school choice hearing that is pending before the school committee. The committee will hear comments from persons present who wish to speak for, against, or neither for nor against school choice. Once the public hearing has commenced, there can be no motions or votes until the hearing has officially concluded. Um, I will entertain a motion to open the public hearing on school choice. So moved. There a second? Second. Okay. Are there members of the public who wish to speak in favor of school choice? Please use the participants tab. Seeing none, are there participants who wish to speak um, in opposition? Is Carolyn. Hi, thank State you. Your name, your name and address. Hi, I'm, I'm Carolyn Mowat, and um, my address is 111 Silver Hill Road in Concord. And I have two children at Alcott and one at CMS. And I'm just here to say that I am in favor for um, choice of wearing masks in school. Oh, no, no, no. We're, this is the school choice hearing. This is about whether or not the, the districts participate in the school choice program in, oh. uh, in Massachusetts. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm sorry. I did not realize that. I didn't mean to take up your time. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Uh, if there are no other comments, then I think that uh, the hearing is now closed and I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. And then, and then after that is Lori, when you give this, your Sarah. memo, and then we vote, right? Yeah, just for clarity, Anthony's here to talk about masks because I know. we communicated I know. with him. So yeah. I just wanted the committee to know oh. that. And uh, yeah, Sarah, you can take a motion. I'm happy to die, discuss when you're in the motion process if there's any other things to talk about. Okay. Because first we have to close the hearing and then we open the vote. Yep. So is there a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. Discussion? Roll call. Anderson, aye. Booth, aye. Marano, aye. Mustafi, aye. Aye. Sorry, Rainey, aye. Rankin, aye. And Wilson, aye. And those are for both, right? Yes. For both and for region. Yeah. And me and Brad and me. Okay. Um, school choice memo. Lori, would you like to speak on this? Certainly. I will just quickly remind you that this is an annual process by Massachusetts law. By the 1st of June, we must consider whether we want to participate or with, withdraw and not participate in school choice. Just for points of clarity, um, when we say we are not participating, it means we are not receiving students. Families can decide at any point to participate in school choice and enroll in a district that is accepting students. That is that is their right as, as citizens in Massachusetts. Nothing has changed for us. The recommendations have been consistent based on the same factors. Uh, one is that our buildings are essentially at capacity, and that remains the case. So we are not, not able to easily um, accept other students from other districts. And transportation is also equally the same in that we don't have a method and a transportation, transportation system that would allow all students to be able to attend in another district. Uh, there's no public system. There's no infrastructure to work with. So nothing has changed for us. This is the annual discussion. And so I would recommend as we have in the past, not to participate in school choice. Okay. Uh, can I 
accept a motion to vote on school choice for the 2022-23 school year. I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote not to participate in the school choice provisions of the state law for the school year 2022-2023 for the reasons so stated. Second. And discussion. Nope, oh, 79 people here. All right. 79. And if you, if, sorry, if you're a member of the public, can I just please remind you to keep your videos off and muted until uh, we get to your time for public comment. Thank you. Um, okay, discussion on school choice. Did we have a second? Forgive me, I can't remember. Yes, I we seconded did. it. Alexa. Sorry, Alexa, thank you. Yep. Okay, having no discussion. Roll call, please. Anderson, I for both. Booth I for both. Marano I for both. Mustafi I for region. Me I for both. Rankin I for both. Wilson for region. Okay. CCHS uh, student update. Hi, Darcy and Harry. Hello. Um, so we actually have a presentation this time, I think. Yeah, perfect. Um, so Darcy and I, you'll see this in a minute, but over the weekend, we went to um, a conference held by the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. And it was a really interesting event. Essentially, it was all the student representatives for different school committees across the state. And Darcy and I chose to participate in subcommittees on mental health and the pandemic. Um, we thought that they were kind of relevant to our school community and also just useful to hear a little bit about what other districts are doing. Um, so some key takeaways, first of all, when compared to other schools, it seems like we're managing the pandemic very well. Um, we heard from some other representatives who talked about the lack of testing resources at their school, um, lower vaccination rates and things like that. And then mental health, the other subcommittee that we sort of interacted with, it seemed like we're also doing a pretty good job with that. And we have another slide a little bit later diving into some more of the like points that we touched upon there. But I don't know, Darcy, if you want to talk a little bit more about some of the events coming up at school. Yeah, definitely. So kind of what Harry already said, but um, when we attended the MASC event, um, even though we definitely um, have some areas of improvement compared to a lot of other schools we interacted with, um, we're doing much better um, throughout the pandemic based on what we saw. There's a lot of schools with vaccination rates at 50 to 60% and we're, we have a very high vaccination rate. Um, and then again, in the mental health area, we saw that we were quite ahead um, compared to a lot of students we interacted with. Um, so I think it was good for Harry and I from both a personal perspective, um, we're really lucky to, great, to go to such a great school, um, but also just kind of reflecting on where we can improve. It was great that we saw that um, overall we're doing a lot better than um, a lot of other towns in Massachusetts uh, based on what we heard at the conference. But yeah, now onto some events. Um, so in the coming weeks, we're gonna connect with CMS Student Council because we wanna also get the perspective of students outside of CCHS to bring to these meetings. Um, we think it's important to represent all members of the CC school community. So we will be connecting with um, some members of the middle school, which will be exciting. Um, and then some events, um, we're currently working on a spring sports fair, a blood drive, a gaming tournament, and a cornhole tournament. And then student government just finished a carnation drive and is working on a dodgeball tournament, trivia night, multicultural food fest, and a hypnotist show. And then um, as vacation is coming soon, um, kind of to be expected, but many students have a lot of assessments and projects this week at the high school. So we're kind of wrapping up and getting ready for vacation. Um, and now onto some things we saw from the conference. Yeah, um, and then after this, we do have um, a slideshow or just sort of a slide about masking and what we heard from a lot of fellow students as far as yeah. like the new policy would go. Yep. Um, yeah, so we went to the subcommittees, as Harry already said, on mental health and COVID. Um, we found that actually we're doing relatively well COVID-wise. A lot of the policies that other schools implemented, we already had in place or were improving on. So we didn't get um, a ton of suggestions on improvements for COVID. Um, but when it comes to mental health, we did get some ideas. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of faculty and students we interacted with suggested outreaching to parents more about student stress um, and kind of allowing them to, or uh, letting them know about what's going on in students' lives because sometimes 
Um, they're not always in the loop. Um, and sometimes a uh, root of stress can be at home. So kind of reaching out to parents more. Um, and then also um, sometimes there is difficulty in reporting to guidance counselors. Um, even though we're super lucky to have many guidance counselors, a lot of students, um, because they don't see their guidance counselor all that often, um, may not feel the most trusting or may not feel the most close to their guidance counselors. So it might be helpful to have anonymous ways of reporting things implemented in the school system. Um, another thing we talked about with different students was mental health training potentially for teachers um, in professional development, because uh, oftentimes teachers are the closest adult to students in the building because they see them the most, they feel the closest to them. So potentially offering that for teachers could be a good solution. Um, I think also just like the utilization of guidance counselors, again, we're so lucky to have uh, uh, 180 to one ratio compared to, I believe it's the 500 to one ratio in the state. Um, but sometimes they may not always be available and kind of just allowing students to have access to guidance counselors. Um, and then also a promotion of resources. So we do have a lot of mental health resources at the school, but kind of promoting that to students because students may not always be aware of the different resources available to them. And then finally, um, in the curriculum department, um, schools kind of similar to us in our district, we talked to Lexington and Wellesley, um, and they're looking at kind of enrollment classes to their, um, to their curriculum instead of AP classes. Um, so that might be something we look at because it does um, offer the ability to take college classes in the high school level, which I know might be a great option for a lot of students. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to do more on this in the future, but I'm sure uh, we want to take it away to the mass policy. So. Darcy, I'm just gonna interrupt you for one moment. Uh, I, can I just remind members of the public that please keep your microphones muted until it gets time to your turn to be your turn to speak in public comment. We have some background noise. Thank you. Yeah, um, um, we'll take it away from here. Yeah, so ever since the announcement about um, the sort of possibility of a changed mask policy, Darcy and I had sort of talked to a lot of our fellow students about their opinions as far as like removing the mask policy. And it seemed like the student body was actually pretty split in regards to removing the mandate. I think in general, we found that most people, most people skewed towards removing. Um, a lot of people talked about how like they don't personally know anyone who's high risk. And obviously our school does have a pretty high vaccination rate. Um, we're well over the 80% threshold that's like recommended or was at least previously recommended by the state. And then another thing I had heard from some people was that if they like still feel uncomfortable, they can just wear their mask. And obviously now we have the use of more effective masks, KN95s, things like that. And then we also heard a lot of like sort of common points against the removal of masks. Um, one common thing was like, we've kind of gotten used to them. I mean, Darcy and I being sophomores, we've never been in high school without masks. So it doesn't seem like there's like this great urgency to stop now. And then also it seems like numbers will likely spike after February break. I mean, whether that would actually happen is of course debatable. Um, but we've seen it before with breaks, so maybe it's not the best time to do it. And then there were a bunch of people who I talked to who just like were sort of neutral they didn't really have a strong opinion. But um, one thing that I've heard a lot and also with some parents that I had talked to, um, I think they felt that it would be important if there was like a clear threshold during which we would put masks back on just to make sure things don't really get out of hand. And then the next one seems a little bit silly, but I actually heard this and I don't know, Darcy, if you agree with me, but I heard this from a lot of people um that people can be a little bit self-conscious you know the mask sort of covers you up and i think for a lot of people that's kind of been nice so far um obviously the masks are going to come off at some point so it's something that's an adjustment that's going to have to take place and then also a lot of students in the building this is unfortunate but a lot of people are wearing their masks incorrectly whether it's under their nose or like just completely under their mouth and i think as like caseloads have dropped teachers and just like even other students have sort of started to care a little bit less about this. So it seems like the masks aren't even really doing as much as they did in the beginning. So yeah, those are some points that Darcy and I, I think wanted to just mention. I don't know if you have anything else to say, but. Um, yeah, Harry kind of covered it, but um, feel free to let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys. This was fantastic. Um, I'm so impressed that you went to the MASC conference. Mm -hmm. I'm more impressed that you brought back all this information to share with us so mm -hmm. nicely organized. And uh, and that's all. It's a lot for us to chew on to in our upcoming conversations over the next uh, few months. So thank you 
for that. Are there any questions from school committee members for Harry and Darcy? I just wanna say this was super helpful and I'm glad to hear from the students at the high school and you have quite an audience tonight. So I'm sure people will be interested in coming back again to listen to you guys because this was really helpful for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy, enjoy your vacation week. You've earned it. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely. Okay, so with that, we can move to public comment now. I'm just going to remind people um, that please use the participants tab, the raise hand feature to get into the queue to speak. Um, and when it's your time, please turn on your video if you want to, definitely your microphone. If you are not speaking, please keep your video and your microphone off. Um, and uh, participants will have three minutes to speak. And uh, just a reminder that this is a meeting, this is the school committee's meeting. It's a public meeting, but it's not a meeting with the public. So while we listen to your questions, your comments, your concerns, and we appreciate hearing from everybody, we will not be re reacting to or interacting uh, during this time. Um, that will also help with timekeeping, I think. Uh, so Anthony, I know you had your hand raised early on, um, and then we have Gail and then Heather is the order that I see so far. So welcome, Anthony Scaduto. And please state your name and your address for the record. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Anthony Scaduto, and I'm a ninth grade student at CCHS. I'm speaking here today in regards to the ongoing mask mandate in school. As you all know, we've been forced to wear masks in school for almost two years, and I'm here to tell you why I think it should end. Masks are extremely damaging to students' mental health and communication skills. Children do not need to wear masks for a virus they are not vulner vulnerable to. Children are at a higher risk for developing serious symptoms from the common flu than COVID-19. For example, masks disrupt learning and create stress among students of all ages, and masks have fueled anxiety and depression across the country, which I've experienced. And positive emotions such as laughing and smiling become less recognizable and negative emotions become more common. Talking with a mask on is like talking on a cell phone where the signal is bad. Also, there are breathing problems associated with mask wearing. Wearing a mask for extended periods of time causes a lack of oxygen to the bloodstream and brain, therefore making it harder to remember, concentrate, and can reduce body ability. And all of these things have affected me during my days at high school. Recently, I was at my sister's basketball game where she had briefly pulled down her mask to breathe. She was instantly yelled at by the referee. On the way home, she had complained of feeling lightheaded during the game and almost passed home. Should we really be doing this to our kids? There is no data proving that mandates work or that children are at a high risk from COVID-19. If mandates are lifted, students who feel safe wearing masks can continue to wear them. Smiling is infectious and is the only infectious thing we need to see in schools. Life has risks and we must learn to live with them. We must follow the science and the science shows masks are unnecessary. It's time to stand up and bring normalcy back where it belongs. Thank you so much for your time and please end the mask mandate. Thank you, Anthony. Um, can you just remind, did you, did you state your address at the beginning? Oh, my, my address is 1212 West Street. Okay, thank you. It just it's something that is part of the routine yeah. here. Yep. Thank you. Okay, um, so Gail. Gail Heyer. Yeah. Hi, yes, I'm getting myself unmuted here. Um, my name is Gail Heyer. I live at 54 Nancy Road in Concord. I have a child at the Alcott School. Um, about 18 months ago, um, and I, I'm gonna speak um, uh, in favor of, of lifting the mask mandate. About 18 months ago, this committee was in a similar position, trying to decide whether to follow the Baker administration's recommendation that it was safe to get kids back into the classroom Many of us were surprised at how well this went, how successful the public schools were at staying open and staying safe here in Concord. 
that wasn't just due to mask wearing. Concord is very fortunate that our schools are not overly crowded. We are also fortunate to have the resources to inspect the buildings and <clears throat> ensure that safe air exchange rates so the kids are not breathing the same air all day. I've been so impressed with how well the kids have adapted to all the COVID rules. But the fact is that masks are a distraction from learning and they negatively impact a student's quality of life as we heard so eloquently from the, the ninth grader just now. It's time to follow the DESE guidance and lift the mask mandate. Thanks. Thank you. Heather. Hi, hold on one sec. I'm gonna start my video. Hey, how are you? Um, I'm Heather Martino. I'm at 69 Southfield Circle in Concord. And I have a, a sixth grader over at Peabody and a ninth grader at Conquer Carlisle High School. Um, and while I appreciate some of the things that have been said, I'm against getting rid of masks because um, I disagree that the science is not there to support it. I think the reason that my family hasn't picked up COVID over the last two years is because Yes, there's good air in the schools and, and they've done a really great job with distancing, but um, we've been around a number of people who've picked up COVID and because they're in school together, they've been contact traced, my kids have been contact traced, they've never picked up COVID and I, I attribute it to the mask policy. The CDC uh, still recommends masks in Middlesex County. Um, I just looked that up before I came on here and personally, uh, my father suddenly died in November, and I have a mother who is immunocompromised and has trouble breathing sometimes because of the chemo med she's on, making her overheated and such. And I'm here with her at least twice a week. So although some of you say that you just, you know, kids don't get COVID, therefore, you know, therefore they don't have to worry about other people if your kid goes to school and gives my kid COVID because there's no mask policy, my kid comes home and essentially could kill my mother. And so that's a very real concern for me. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Colleen Balsman. Hi, Colleen Walston, One Hawthorne Village, Concord. Um, this is not about masks, but as I was looking at the ELL English Language Learner Update, I noticed that again, Level Literacy Intervention, LLI, is mentioned as a curriculum in use. Um, as you're aware, LLI is not an evidence-based curriculum. I will remain ever hopeful that someone on the school committee will begin to ask the administration to engage in research when selecting and paying for programs and professional development for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Todd Benjamin. Okay. Hello, everyone. Here we are. All right, uh, Todd Benjamin, Triple uh, Three Sudbury Road. Um, thanks for the time tonight. So as we all know, our community has done a great job in fighting COVID. We have high level of vaccinations. Incidents in schools have been declining precipitously over the past four weeks, if not longer. And as we all know, nothing will be perfect. And we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We need to end the mask mandate now. If we don't do it now, when will we ever do it? This is an opportunity to safely and prudently take a meaningful step to reduce stress on teachers, students, and staff. No one likes wearing masks. And if people do want to wear masks, they can. That should be their choice and it should be their parents' choice if they want to. And you know what, if we do this, we won't be alone. 35 states don't have masking requirements and more and more states are lifting mandates for masking in school on a daily basis. As we heard Anthony so eloquently state, it's not good for our kids' mental health to have for them to be constantly wearing masks and, and to have this constant level of fear in their lives. We've been told that the mask mandate will be revisited, and now is the time to revisit it and to end it. We can't be afraid to do what is right and what is best for our kids. We need to listen to our kids, we need to listen to the parents, and we need to do what is right and end the mask mandate now. Let people choose their own path and if they want to wear masks and not have it be forced upon them. Thank you. Thank you. Monica, please state your name and address. Yep, Monica Greenfield, 110 Carlisle Pines Drive, Carlisle, Mass. 
And I'm calling, um, I'm here today to speak against uh, keeping the mask mandate. I believe it should be optional. Um, we now know that natural immunity is six times higher. These kids are all vaccinated. I don't know why we're still, still wearing masks when the population in Massachusetts had, has had full access to vaccinations. We now know that seven, Per the CDC, we now know that 7.4% of children ages 13 to 17, um, approximately 4.5 million have been diagnosed with behavioral problems. 7.1% of children aged 13 to 17 years, 4.4 uh, million have been diagnosed with anxiety. 3.2% of children aged 13 to 17 years old, approximately 1.9 million have been diagnosed with depression. OSHA requires uh, a 19.5% oxygen level to work in any space and normal oxygen levels are anywhere from 20 to 21. The science tells us that masks lower it to 19.5% in as little as 15 seconds. We also know that masks only filter out particles of 0.3 micron size, but the coronavirus is 0.125, meaning the masks are totally useless. We now know that Rachel Walensky of the CDC has said that Cloth masks never worked. They were merely facial decoration. With all of this and moving forward, this is endemic now. We have treatments, we have vaccines, and these kids uh, are mostly vaccinated. And it is up to each of us personally to take our own personal responsibility for ourselves and our health at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Meredith. Um, hi. Meredith Rose, um, 473 Powder Mill in Concord. Um, so I'm here to um, speak on behalf of keeping the masks on. Um, I have a rising fourth and a rising kindergartner. Um, the kindergartner is not yet able to be vaccinated. So while some of the previous callers have talked about how everyone is able to be vaccinated, that's absolutely not true as we know for children under five. And um, I will say that I was moved by um, the two sophomores who spoke earlier. And I can, I can totally understand how at the high school where um, perhaps you would be less likely to even have a sibling in that age range or know of someone who was immunocompromised that, and with the higher vaccination rate at that school, I, I, I totally understand the, the desire. Um, but I think for a parent like me who has children in the elementary school, um, we do know, I'm not sure that the science supports some of the statements that have been made previously, we do know that masks, when worn collectively, help keep everyone collectively more safe. Um, so the individual choice part, again, at least for the smaller children, um, I don't know if there's any way to maybe differentiate in the decision making there, but um, I would ask that at least until maybe propose that at least until the entire population, <laughs> including those under five, can be vaccinated and have some level immunity of immunity, excuse me, some level of protection, that we keep the masks on, um, particularly in the elementary school. Um, I think that if we were to ask the kids themselves um, if they'd be willing to sustain a minor inconvenience for another few months to protect their classmates, younger sibling who can't be vaccinated yet, or their older sibling who has diabetes, that the children would absolutely say, yes, of course, because we've taught them this. We're teaching them this specifically to care about others collectively. Um, so I do think if given that choice, that that's the choice that they would make. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Monica, if you have another comment to make, uh, I'll give you another minute. If not, then you can unraise your hand. Great, thank you. Terry, and I'm just gonna remind people that we do do, we do 15 minutes of public comment at the beginning, and then we'll return to public comment this evening before our actual vote. Um, and so we have another four minutes left in this 15 minute uh, block. Terry, welcome. Hi, yes, I'm Terry Bono at 73 Katarina Heights. I'm in uh, favor of ending the mask mandate. I think a lot has already been stated. I feel like it directly impacts learning. Um, it's impacting the social emotional well-being of our students. It's impacting them physically. 
um, their oxygen intake with exercise, exercise and sports. I just ran up my stairs, sorry. <laughs> Um, I just ask you to collectively look as a board to make this work for Concord students and all looking at all of them and looking at the vaccination rate, looking at the student ratio that have that have been capable of being vaccinated and safely implement something in place in time. Um, the data does show that there is a huge impact in their academic learning. So I am in favor and I won't go any, any further. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, yeah. Yep. Do you have something else? No. Okay. Uh, Carolyn. I think Carolyn. Well, Hi, I'm just, I'm back and I'm sorry for jumping in early and coming to the meeting late and and being at the wrong point to offer my opinion, but I would just like to first say thank you all for having this meeting, for doing, for considering all of this. I know that the goal for everybody here is to keep everybody safe, but I am in favor of ending the mask mandate. Um, oh, excuse me. I'm at 111 Silver Hill Road, um, and it's Carolyn Mowat, M-O-W-A-T. Um, like I said, I have two at Alcott and one at um, Sanborn. And I am just at the point now where um, I know for at least my family and and I'll only speak for myself, um, that we have taken every precaution, um, gotten every, followed every single CDC guideline, have worn masks, have gotten vaccines, have gotten boosted, um, have also gotten COVID. And um, I am now at the point where I think someone just needs to be um, advocating for the kids and the mental health of the kids and especially the younger children who are not being touched by teachers who um, are learning to read and learning to learn and can't see a teacher sound out a word like at <laughs> or you know um, who can't be touched by a teacher when they're learning to write can't be taught how to hold a pencil when they're learning to write and for our older kids just in terms of the mental health and, and not being able to share a smile, a laugh, facial expressions, I think it's gotten to a point where I've seen um, a lot of really easygoing kids um, become really anxious. And um, that's my concern at this point with declining numbers, the ubiquity of the vaccine rates in this particular community. And I hope we can look if we're gonna follow science and follow data that we look at the data of this particular community and what we have all done collectively um, to keep everybody safe. So I am in support of ending it and I appreciate uh, your time tonight. Thank you. And with that, we will end the first public comment um, opportunity for the evening. We will come back to it later on. So stay tuned. Um, uh, Recognitions. So well, now it is time to formally recognize and welcome Carrie Rankin, our newest school committee member. Carrie, can you just uh, introduce yourself a little bit to everybody? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Carrie Rankin. I have three children, um, one who is in preschool at Concord Children's Center. Uh, my second, who is Leah, who is a kindergartner at Thoreau, and a second grader who is um, Cooper, also at Thoreau. Um, we've been in Concord for about nine years, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be on the committee. I look forward to participating in all these conversations and um, getting to know all the members of the committee, as well as the many people who are on this call tonight. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay. Um, uh, reading of the minutes. Is there a motion to accept the... the uh, Minutes open session from the region for January 11th and January 18th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Roll call. Anderson, I for both. Booth, I for both. Marano, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Rini, I for both. Rankin abstain because I was not a member. <laughs> and Wilson for region. Um, I obtain a motion to approve the open session Concord School Committee min minutes of January 2022 20, and executive session minutes of 61521 uh, as in the executive session minutes are revised. 
So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Anderson, aye. Who's aye? Murano, aye. Sweeney, aye. Rankin, abstain. Um, and then a uh, motion for a oh, note. Yeah, so you're all done. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, correspondence on the region side, we had 15 plus correspondence regarding mask, uh, the mask, well, the face covering policy. And I think uh, public schools had around 17. Yeah. And one question about the yearbook. Um, um, chairs and liaisons reports. Tracy, do you want to kick this off? Sure, I will start. Um, the DEI subcommittee met last week and we are continuing our work together and doing some work around um, DEI initiatives in the schools and starting to plan for goals that as members of the subcommittee that we are going to kind of bring back to you guys, hopefully, We'll bring it back in March and we can have a full committee discussion on that. So just really focusing in on maybe three priorities that we're looking at. And then we are going to continue our training. And as I, I think I briefly mentioned it earlier, so I had a discussion with Dr. Martin and some of the dates did not work for some of our members. So the 29th is definitely a no. Um, so she's going back to Ed to see what they can do for us. So it looks like I will be back to you with three new dates. So we'll be March and April and hopefully be done well before May. Any questions on any of that? Nope. Okay. And I think that's all I had. And I don't believe Andrew's joining us tonight. I don't see him on here. No, so Andrew will join us at our next meeting um, to go over kind of, you know, our process and, and where we're moving and the equity survey and where we're at with all of that. And our next DEI meeting for anyone on the call that would like to come is the first week in March and it will be posted probably on Friday. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. Um, are there other chairs liaisons reports? Alexa. Sure, um, the CPAC met last Thursday. Um, we had a pretty productive meeting that was predominantly focused on scheduling for the spring. Uh, we are hoping to have the CPAC present to the school committee in May, and some of the specific dates are being ironed out. Um, we, additionally, um, the administration is going to present to the CPAC, well, to the school committee, on early literacy that will happen is in May and that will be followed by a larger sort of more public forum. We haven't had one of those in a while. Um, I feel like we had so many forums in COVID, but um, so that will also happen shortly thereafter, also in May. Um, the CPEC will also have their appreciation awards also in May. <laughs> so May is um, shaping up to be a pretty busy month for um, the special education community. And then I'll also note um, the, the CPAC has worked in um, collaboration with interim director Debbie Dixon to put out um, a series that is actually happening now, I think the next, um, all throughout the week where uh, parents in the special education community have a chance to have sort of these informal coffees um, with the different special education coordinators at each building or sorry at each kind of grade level K through five in the middle school and uh, and up at the high school level so there's a robust amount of collaboration happening right now which I think is all um, really positive and exciting. Eva do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, I just wanted to add uh, today um, to your point, uh, administration um, and CPAC and many parents were on a coffee call uh, with the uh, high school coordinator for special education. Um, so uh, parents uh, got another uh, opportunity to ask uh, questions related to transition into the high school uh, for students uh, with IEPs and um, uh, even with 504 plans. Um, also, um, they, they, um, 
they were able to learn uh, who to contact and uh, what is the role of the um, uh, special ed uh, coordinator. Um, so it was a very helpful um, session today. Great, thank you. Um, Court? Yeah, very quickly, uh, the public act Public Access Advisory Committee met last week. Uh, I had school committee conflicts, but was in communication with the committee and uh, through them with members of the town manager's staff in regard to a small line item, $8,000 that has been uh, earmarked for upgrades in school, uh, specifically the Ripley building. Um, so I hope to have some specifics. Uh, the the work and the interface between Minuteman Media, the Comcast funded town uh, public access television, uh, and, and the schools um, will will have to be put together so that uh, that money can be expended on behalf of the the building and make it a little easier to go out live in the future. More to follow. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, do we have any other? I'll do a quick update on select board last night. Yep. Uh, interim manager Carrie LaFleur announced that town staff would recommend to the Board of Health, which is meeting right now, to lift the mask mandate in Concord on March 7th. Uh, so we'll have to see how their deliberations go. Um, yeah, they had a robust discussion about ARPA, but did not reach a decision. And they had a discussion about the Ripley allocation formula and voted to support it. Okay. Thank Sarah, I had, I had one more thing. I did go to the DEI commission meeting for the town last okay. week, and I'm happy to liaise for that unless anyone else would like to do that, because there's a lot of discussion about um, you know, policy, town, town things, education, and they're really getting organized, which is great. So, um, you know, I'm happy to continue to go to those or if anyone else would like to join me or go in my place, that's fine too. But um, it was a great meeting and the town can look forward to a survey coming in the near future. Okay. Um, thank uh, sorry, and I just wanted to add, um, uh, uh, coming out of the CPAC, uh, informational sessions uh, that um, there's a lot, a great deal uh, happening at uh, also at the high school uh, when it comes to literacy. Uh, Landmark uh, Outreach is working, um, administration is working with uh, Landmark Outreach to bring in uh, language-based uh, learning in a classroom. So that's really exciting. Um, so uh, parents were able to learn a little bit more about that. Okay. Okay. Um, then now, thank you so much for patiently waiting and joining us this evening, Emily Ferrara. Um, and we're very lucky to have you here tonight. And, um, Hi, thank you for having me. So, it, so is there, is there a way I can share my screen? Will that work? Should work, Emily. Should work. Let me see. Kristen, yeah. do you want to just cue Emily up while she's screen sharing and talk a little bit about ELL in the district? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to. Of course, my dog chose this moment to bark and he's <laughs> smiling up until this point. Uh, ELL is uh, our program for our English language learners. Um, and we have five teachers over all of uh, the districts and uh, they ably serve all of our students. Uh, students who are considered English language learners are part of our general education population and they are uh, administrated under um, the Civil Rights uh, Act. Uh, so that's a national act. So we do compliance work with that uh, about every five years. Um, and for the past maybe three years, uh, has been uh, ably led by Emily, who was the person who I called anyway every time we had to do anything with the EL, because uh, she knows absolutely everything and this has been an incredible strength for us. So I, I just asked her to come and talk about what it's like to um, be an English language learner student in our program and teacher. 
So with that, are you able, do you have screen sharing? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, so thanks again for having me. Um, I'm very excited to share our program. Um, it's not every day that, you know, we, we talk about uh, this program as it's, it's small, but it's super important. Um, so I'm going to share some slides along the way here. And this should pop up. Okay. So um, I wanted to start with kind of how our program um, runs in, in Concord, um, but also it's something that we follow, like Kristen said, it's a, it's a national, state, um, federal laws that we follow for this. Um, when, when students arrive and families arrive, they start off by filling out a lot of paperwork. And one of those things that they fill out is the home language survey. Um, and the home language survey uh, is, is very vital for information for us uh, at each school um, to understand a little bit about what the family uh, is speaking um, and interacting with at home. Um, and we have families that have, you know, they go home and they speak primarily a totally different language than English um, to families that only speak occasionally um, with some family members. Um, but we take all of that into consideration when we're looking at students um, because this program is part of the general ed curriculum um, and any student who you know, shows that they could use some support around especially academic language in English um, can you know, be in our program. So they fill out the home language survey um, if any of these questions come up other than English, uh, that's when they're given to the, uh, the EL teacher at each building, um, where we kind of do some, some more digging. We, you know, we look at records from previous schools, we talk to the students, um, we talk to the if families if we, if we need more information. We also do a screener. Um, there's an English language screener that we use uh, for uh, through WIDA, W-I-D-A, uh, called the WIDA screener. It's also the annual assessment that we give. We're in the, the throes of that right now, doing the access test. Um, but the screener gives us information about academic language in, in the four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, and it not just looks at at general English, but really dives into can the students really manipulate academically at their grade level in different curriculum areas. Um, and based off of kind of a standard store that score that they've given us, uh, they can qualify for the program um, or not. Um, so once students are in our program, um, you'll notice I, I did some digging. This is just for this school year, current school year. Um, based off of the home languages that we've received through home language surveys um, for Concord, EL, and FEL, I'll explain that a little bit, but that's former English learners um, and their families. So this only represents the students that have come through our program. This doesn't even represent everyone who has not been in our program. So as you can see, it's very diverse. Um, primarily, we have Chinese, Arabic, Portuguese, Spanish tend to be our highest uh, numbers each year, and that fluctuates a little bit, but then we have so many other languages that are represented by sometimes only one family um, or, or just a few, uh, but it spreads across the district pre-K through 12, um, uh, it, and it's, it's amazing to, to learn about all of these students and families. Also, if you look at the, the breakdown of the languages, again, just EL students and former EL students and families um, by school, you can see how it kind of is, is distributed across those schools um, with this representation. Um, again, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty spread out. And also, if you look at our, our numbers overall for the last about five years. Overall, we, we have dipped a little bit. We usually sit at about, for, for pre-K pre to 12, we usually sit at about 70 um, total. Uh, we have dipped a little, and I think that is totally explained by the last two years. Um, a lot of our families um, come for you know, business opportunities, um, and jobs, and, and a lot of that has been halted the last two years. 
Um, so there's been a little bit of a dip overall, um, but otherwise we've been pretty, you know, some years will will increase and sometimes will decrease, uh, but we sit at about 70 students. Performer English learners uh, that have been through our program and have shown that they have acquired enough academic language to kind of be, be on their own. Um, you'll notice there's always a very big jump at the middle school level. And this is totally typical. Uh, research, research shows that English language learners typically take around six years to really master and acquire academic English proficiently. Uh, so therefore, a lot of students and families are coming when students are young. So that you know, four to six years uh, that it takes for them to, to gain that English really lands them at that middle school level. So we have a lot of students that have exited our program, um, but we continue to monitor them. So FELL students, uh, which we call them former English learners, are monitored uh, for four years um, where we you know, do check-ins and just make sure it's an extra set of eyes to make sure everything is going well academically for them. Uh, the curriculums that we use across the grade levels in this, this is the specific program that we use uh, for the elementary level. It's by National Geographic called the REACH um, EL program. Uh, and that's what we base our content uh, specifically around. We also use at the middle school, uh, we use national, the National Geographic curriculum for that, which is uh, we use inside um, as well. And I'll, this targets listening, speaking, reading, and writing in all of the domains. There's great articles and stories in here that have to do with science and math and the things that students are learning in their classroom, which is excellent. We also, you know, add in um, district uh, curriculums that are being used, you know, as needed um, for each student to cater to what they need. Uh, and use those access scores that we get every year to kind of drive our, our uh, instruction for those students. So the WIDA, WIDA consortium is kind of our, if you think of how we use, um, you know, the MCAS in Massachusetts um, and, and the standards, uh, curriculum standards, this is what EL teachers and students uh, reference. The WIDA consortium is uh, used by over 40 states in the United States, and they create the standards that we follow. They create the uh, testing that intake, you know, the intake testing that we do, and they also create the annual assessment um, that is a state assessment, just like MCAS, that's given every uh, January. Uh, this year and last year, they, they gave us an extension because of COVID. Um, to, to take a little bit longer, which has been helpful. Um, but each assessment is uh, tiered for each grade level. Um, it's also, uh, it's also, it also looks at students um, at their level. And so there's two different uh, testing levels that students can qualify for, um, but they're looking for specific uh, domain scores uh, in their overall score and their literacy score for them to show that they have enough academic language uh, to, to be in the classroom on their own without uh, help. Uh, these, uh, and something else that's interesting is these assessments are computer-based from grades one through 12. So as early as first grade, these students are learning how to um, maneuver these tests, which are super easy. Um, there's instructions that are you know built in, there's instructions and manuals that are given by uh, the teachers and uh, they have practice built in um, and there's a, it's multiple choice mostly. Uh, the writing is, uh, is written uh, itself. The younger students though, grades one through three, they do do writing on paper. It's not expected that they know how to type yet. We also, as a district, and you know, are required by the state um, and the government to to have translations available to families who request that. So, when families fill out that home language survey, they the one of the uh, there's two questions that we ask: Would they like to have written and oral translations? Um, so that's where we start. We do check in with families, uh, and there's been you know families that have requested later on or have said, 
um, I'm all set now, thank you. So that changes, uh, but we are required to do translations. So we do use um, uh, companies for translations of documents that are considered you know, school level important documents, the IEPs, the progress reports, um, things like that. And then we also use other tools to communicate with families. Uh, one of the biggest ones, Google Translate has been helpful, I'm sure for everybody at some point, whether you've traveled or uh, you know, talked with someone before. So that can be a tool. We also use uh, a translating texting app called uh, Talking Points with families uh, who'd like that. Um, Class Dojo is something you may have heard at the elementary level that some teachers use that also has a built-in translation feature. Uh, so that's just some of them. Um, and one thing that we added this year that's been fantastic is if you look at the Concord, uh, the public school website, it now has a drop down translation tool for the entire website in the top right corner. So um, any family that's looking at our district uh, to move here, they can translate all of the things that are there. So that's a, a great resource. Uh, a few other things to think about when we're thinking about these kiddos, uh, that these students you know, are in the general ed population and that they can and should qualify for any other services that they may need. Uh, they can you know, get special education services. They can have RTI if they need extra help. Um, and that's all things that we you know, coordinate with everybody at the, at the school level. Uh, that all teachers, that work with our EL students are SEI endorsed. And that was a directive about, I think over 10 years ago now uh, from the state where teachers had to get this endorsement, it's attached to their license. Um, and so any, any teacher that works with our students has that endorsement. They have extra training around English language teaching. Um, and so that's very helpful for our students. Uh, there's also, you know, we, we also remind our teachers and um, everyone working with our students that there are students that arrive at totally different times of the year. Uh, there's uh, countries, you know, that have different start and end times to their school year, such as I, I always use Brazil as an example, uh, where they're ending their school year around December, you know, starting their summer vacation when we're getting ready for the holiday season. And they are uh, just finishing their year, but if they come here, they're in the middle of ours. So, you know, that's a transition that we help families with um, to understand how our school system is different um, and where we might be placing those students um, for that. EL, our EL students range uh, based off of those scores in a range of one to six, but one to five is really what we're looking at. Um, uh, one and two being our newcomer students or our, our lower English level students, uh, three, four, five are higher students. Um, our fell students, like I had mentioned, are our former English learners and we monitor them for four years and follow them to make sure they're making progress. We also have a subgroup um, of students uh, that we, that we you know, take care of called SLIFE. Um, and SLIFE is, stands for Students with Limited or Interrupted Formal Education. Um, and they're identified through a process during the intake uh, assessments and everything. Um, for students who, who may have had you know, a, a big gap in schooling, they, you know, uh, there's a checklist that we go by. You know, they're reading at at least two grade levels behind. Um, and so they need extra support. And so we, created a we create a special plan for each individual student in that scenario um, to make sure that they're getting everything that they need. Um, another interesting uh, piece of information that I like to share to people is about the, the silent period. Um, and when we have students that come from, you know, new places and have never had any English before, um, that it's completely normal uh, for them to have this silent period where they do not speak, they do not do any output of the language for three to six months at times. Um, and we've had students uh, like this, but they're intaking it all and they're listening. Um, and it's amazing that somewhere in the middle of the year, they just, they just start producing the language. Um, but that can last longer than I think some people realize. But I like to remind people to put the put yourself in their shoes and think about if you were to go to a foreign country that you don't know the language and you were to be put into a graduate level class, which might be where you are academically now, and uh, you were asked questions. I, 
I know that I wouldn't be raising my hands if I were in, you know, Japan or China um, and I didn't know that language. Um, I'd be looking for other people who speak my language. Um, I'd be, you know, listening for cognates or words that, you know, sound uh, mean the same thing. Um, so all of those things that I would be doing, these students are doing too. So friend, uh, reminder for our teachers um, that that goes on and that it's, it's a team effort with these, uh, with our students um, and families and that we're all involved. Uh, and it's been a pleasure working with our, our families. Wonderful presentation, Emily. I'm just wondering if anybody has, uh, any school com committee members have questions for Emily. Well, thank you very much. I know um, sometimes you don't have a lot of uh, forewarning of, of students or families coming in for English language and it can be very challenging having a large family come in sort of you know, un unknown and and you really have to ramp up and it could be a new uh, language. And uh, I, I know that sometimes it's difficult to understand they speak a language, but they read in another language. So um, I've just had, I've had some firsthand experience with it recently. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work and it's really rewarding work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's fun because you get to learn about different culture. And I think it's great for the students in the school. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's, um, I think I'm sure the, the whole um, profession is really kind of going at, at breakneck speed. I mean, these, we didn't have these uh, tools and um, uh, standards that you have access to today. So um, I think any student who comes to our districts as an English language learner is really lucky to have you and the staff working with them. Yes, thank you. For sure. Emily, it's nice to see you and thank you for your time and your presentation. Um, <clears throat> I'm working with a, a student from Afghanistan in, a, in an adjacent district. Um, and we're, we're struggling to try to communicate in Dari through Persian. Uh, so you can imagine it's tricky. Um, can you speak, you spoke to how we would uh, uh, bring in a new student and a new family. How do you bring in a new language? Like if, if the family has a new language? Yeah, like for example, if uh, if suddenly we needed Dari um, in the district for one, you know, for a very small number of students. Yes, so there are, and Court, we, we can touch base. Um, I had, I think I might have some resources uh, that I can share with you around that. Um, there's a lot of teacher sharing behind the scenes. So I'm in contact with um, many of the district uh, EL leaders uh, around here that mm -hmm. we stay in contact and meet often to discuss these, uh, these resources that we're looking for or need. Um, also the translation service that we use, uh, we can pick up the phone and call and get a translator you know, on, on call, in person, on Zoom, um, right away in, in any language. Also the Department of Ed, all of the documents that we send home um, for any family, we translate those, but the De Department of Ed has translated uh, most of those in all the languages that are needed, most of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that language has recently been done as well um, because the influx of that language coming into our state. Um, so there's different resources that I use. Uh, Google Translate uh, sometimes is, is the, the, the go-to in the moment if I'm you know, meeting a family myself and I don't know the language. Um, we might start with that uh, just to communicate basic information um, and or you know, get a translator on a call. Thank you. So this, this next one's probably uh, more rhetorical uh, and or uh, directed at our budget. Um, you, you've seen a, a bit of a drop in numbers, largely uh, pandemic related. Um, can I assume we have the capacity to uh, expand again when uh, uh, travel is a little more, a little more uh, possible? Yes, we, we definitely have the resources we need for, for what we're doing now and for more to come, for sure. Good, thank you. 
I should mention just because it hasn't come up yet that we do receive an entitlement grant called Title III that supports our work with English learners. Um, how we choose to spend it in Concord is that we have an optional summer school. We don't have to offer summer school for English learners, um, but it's our choice and we do offer it for all of our English language learners, no matter their proficiency with English. And um, the other thing we do is particularly at the middle school and the high school level, and particularly, Court, as you bring up with the languages that um, are rarer to us, um, is that we often provide the student an iPad so they can easily themselves translate in the moment uh, a page of text in English, you know, a worksheet or a whatever it is, a page of a textbook, uh, or even a page online um, right into their home language. Thank you. Eva? Yes, uh, I just wanted to ask um, uh, how many uh, students, uh, first uh, ELL students, uh, do we have at the high school? And also, what are you doing to, uh, for these students to uh, help them navigate the social, um, uh, so social challenges during the lunchtime? The high school has about 12 EL students, a, a larger list of former English learners that are helped and monitored as well. Um, and the students have, have access to any and all that everybody else does. So guidance is involved with EL students. Um, if there's, you know, friendship or um, student things at lunch going on, the EL teacher at the high school uh, is phenomenal and she uh, she has lunch groups sometimes going on during her own lunchtime. Um, she sets kids up with after school curriculum uh, programs. She also sets them up with sports programs that they might not have known about. Um, so she goes ab above and beyond to make those connections for those students. Great. Yeah, Alexa? Yeah, Emily, um, I. I'm thinking about sort of the sort of, well, I guess, I guess all age kids um, when the language is a, is a real barrier where there's very little um, English spoken, like how much of like, what does a typical day look like? Like how much are these students in sort of the gen ed population are, are some of the more intensive language um, sort of, the academic, are they pull out? Are they immersive? How, you know, I know we talk so much about inclusion in this district, but I guess, I mean, that, that seems like really like an obstacle. So how do you guys do it? I'm just so curious, like yeah. what it looks like. So uh, for, for new students who, who do not have a lot of English, um, our program follows the guidance by the state uh, for about one and a half hours of direct EL instruction. Um, so a lot of times, especially at the elementary level, uh, that, that's a pullout uh, scenario where they're you know, pulled out of their classroom at strategic times for an hour and a half more if they need it. Um, for direct instruction with the elementary teacher. The classes at the middle school and high school are specific EL classes that they go to for an hour and a half. Um, as far as the other classes, right, because if, if they're not an EL, you know, what's happening, um, teachers uh, go and push in to support. Um, so there's, you know, help that goes into classroom and supports them. Um, there is uh, behind the scenes modifications happening with the EL teacher and the curriculum teachers to modify the curriculum at their level. Um, so if they're, you know, have a huge, you know, five page paper and, you know, we're dealing with a newcomer who's just not at that level, then we will modify that to be at their level um, so that they can access the curriculum. Extraordinary. That's great. Thanks. Tracy? Um, is there any effort to pair families together that speak the same language? Because I know that, you know, it, it's been challenging for new families, even just coming to Concord and being a bit isolated over the past couple of years, but to kind of pair those families together to have a touch point with some commonality. 
Yes, uh, we stay in contact all the time, the Yale teachers across the district. Um, and there are families, like if, if, if we receive a family at Alcott that speaks a certain language, and I know that there's another family um, that may speak that language at Thoreau, you know, I'll contact the teacher and we'll ask the families for permission if it's okay to share their contact if they're interested. And we have joined families that way, which is, you know, fantastic. Um, sometimes there's only those, you know, two families in district, um, but sometimes we can make connections outside of the district too. There are uh, some other, you know, there's um, like, a, a, uh, there's some different schools uh, where families, you know, go for native language instruction. There's Chinese schools, there's um, other outreach places that uh, we have, you know, sent families some information for to connect with other people from their culture and uh, language. Um, I have a question. Um, um, for full disclosure, my daughter was ELL for one period for, for a time because we came from Italy. And there was a, an episode where she was not able to perform in math because she was not familiar with American coins, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, and, and it was a learning moment for our school because it was a sort of a cultural competency kind of thing uh, for them. So I'm wondering, is there a mechanism by which your your teachers can communicate with Kristen about these kinds of um, th these kinds of awarenesses um, because some somebody's intelligence or or knowledge base may be rich it just different than 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 ours and that would of course inform I think our own DEI development in a very meaningful way so is there a mechanism through which those uh, kinds of interactions get codified and recorded? Uh, the, the best method is, is always chatting and talking with, with our colleagues, um, you know, staying in contact with the teachers that work with the EL students, ha going to those team meetings. Um, we've had numerous professional development uh, that I and others have run around that specific, those specific uh, ideas and needs. Um, to show different cultural, you know, you made me think of, you know, I ha I've had some German students where, you know, using the, the comma versus the, the period in decimals and, you know, just small things like that. Or um, so sh sharing that information, also the background knowledge that we have as EL teachers share that with the teachers that work with students as we know, there, you know, we're learning all the time too with all of these languages. There, you know, every every year I learn something new, which is fantastic. So it's it's a learning curve for everybody, um, but we, we're always in contact with those teachers. And I would just add, there's a um, you know for about the last six years, maybe five years, there's been a district wide. Um, cultural competency committee meeting on Wednesday afternoons and our EL staff have been great supporters of that. Uh, it's an optional meeting and they've just shown up uh, to represent their students and their needs. So that's great. And then uh, Emily in particular sits on a lot of, uh, she sits on the elementary uh, leadership team um, of team leaders for the district, um, folks from every school called the uh, elementary steering committee. And then there's student support teams at uh, the middle school and the high school that also have representation from uh, EL there as well. Great, thanks. Um, there are no more comments from school committee members, no more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for joining us. This was uh, really meaningful. And, uh, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Agenda item discussion B, uh, assistant superintendent search. Lori? Yep. Thanks. So we'll just give you an update on where we are in the process. We are actively interviewing Yes, today, yesterday, it feels like yesterday, it was this morning, <laughs> this morning and tomorrow, uh, a number of candidates, we expect to have the finalists named, if not tomorrow by Thursday or Friday, that will lead us to a series of reference checks and those finalists will each come to the district the week after vacation, one per day for an extended visit 
you can see I have drafted out visits with administrators, the business office, some time out in the schools, and then some sessions with the school committee. The goal is to stay on track with the schedule and be as assertive as we've been. Uh, we know we know other districts have already made offers, so we're trying to stay very competitive. And so far, it looks like we're on track for a recommended candidate to the school committee on the, on March 8th. So thank you, Alexa and Court are participating if they want to add anything, as, as well as a, about 10 others that are representing all different departments across the district and different union leadership and a really nice, nice array of stakeholders in the in the meetings. A lot of people are making this process move very efficiently, notwithstanding its speed. It's been very thorough. And I, Alexa, I'm sure you'll share with me uh, kudos to Kristen Herbert for coordinating a great deal of this. Thank you. Do school community members have any, uh, any questions about that uh, outline? No. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, second reading of the school committee policy on athletic concussion regulations. Uh, I'm going to ask that we postpone this one uh, because we don't have in the minutes a reference to an actual vote. Uh, and so I think we can postpone it. Uh, more notably, we can postpone it uh, comfortably because there's no change of any substance, although it's been really carefully reviewed. Uh, there's, there's uh, everything that's in force is going to serve us very nicely until we uh, have the second reading with a black and white reference to a vote for purposes of uh, public uh, anticipation of anything that we do here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, do we need to vote to? No, to we're just. We okay. Nothing's going to get moved or uh, presented. Yeah. And that was a discussion. So thank no. you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so with that, move to COVID update and the uh, face covering policy. Dr. Hunter? So, yeah, great. I'll take it from here and set us up. So I wanted to start tonight with the data as I usually do. I think that's an important factor in our discussion. I've been especially focused, as you know, on our local school related data, and that's what I'm bringing you. I went back a little further than I have been just so you could see patterns. This goes back to the beginning of November, uh, all the way through the surge and into this week where as of this morning, when I pulled it, we had three cases, we've had two more since, so we're at five for the week. Uh, you can see that we have dramatically declined over the last month as have the numbers across the Commonwealth and the, and the country and internationally, in fact. Uh, overall, we're sitting at 724 cases total throughout the school year. And I left, I don't have the pool testing results for this week yet, but there they are for last week with 14, almost 1500 students tested and 350 staff only two positives, which is great improvement over what we were seeing a month ago. A reminder of our vaccination rates, as mentioned during the night, we are very fortunate to have a community that is highly vaccinated at all of our schools, essentially. So I just wanted to remind you of those. And then some updates of what's occurred since our last meeting, which is what has brought us to the discussion tonight. On February 9th, the governor and commissioner uh, lifted the mask mandate in the schools as of the 28th. Essentially, they are letting it expire. Concord Board of Health met tonight, is probably still meeting. They met tonight. Uh, updates from that meeting, and we have some members of the group that were there. Uh, they have rescinded the Concord mask mandate effective tonight and are deferring to the schools in terms of our plans for whether the 28th, the 7th, et cetera. And I'm going to make a recommendation in a moment, but the Concord mask mandate is, re is rescinded as of midnight, which is probably even a little faster than we expected might happen. I have linked your mask policy that was voted 
back in the early part of the school year. I'm not going to pull that up and go through it. It essentially says masks have been mandated in the schools, as you know, um, with some policy for alternatives if there were any special education or medically compromised students that needed alternatives. We've had almost none of that, very few. So my recommendations, and then we can open it up for discussion. Uh, Trisha McGeehan is here from the Board of Health, as is Marcia Rasmussen, who's interim health director. And I know you've heard the community's feedback all week through email and now tonight. So I thought it would be helpful if I made a recommendation for the starting point of your discussion, and then you could talk that through. Uh, so I am recommending that we go to optional masking for kindergarten through grade 12 and post-secondary at Ripley to begin on March 7th. This allows us to get past the vacation week where we have seen spikes. I went back through that data again uh, today and yesterday, and indeed that has been a fact. So I think it gets us all a little breathing space to let the travel happen in any cases resulting from travel. Uh, it, notably, they'll be less than they, they were in January, but I think it gives us all a little bit more level playing field in terms of the predictability and the, the variables. Preschool, I recommend remain masked until the vaccine is readily available. Uh, it is not, as you've heard tonight, for the kids under five. In fact, it was slowed this past week, so we aren't sure of the timeline, and I'd recommend leaving that open-ended for the moment. It is not up to us whether kids are wearing masks on buses. That is a mandate at the federal level, so that must stay in place. We must remain masked on the buses, and we must remain masked in the health offices at every school. So we certainly can accommodate that, and um, we'll have to keep our habits as is for now. Anyone positive, we are on the five-day quarantine. If you are positive, returning to school on day six, being masked for uh, days six through 10. We are looking for that to remain in place for anyone returning to school after being positive for those remaining five days. Unvaccinated students will be strongly encouraged to mask per DESI and DPH, that is current protocol. Unvaccinated staff, of which we are at under 1%, they were granted exemptions back in the fall when you put in a mandate for the staff, they must remain masked per, their, per, per our district policy. And I don't expect they will have any issue with that given the conversations. It's really, really important to stress if that we go in this direction, people are going to do different things based on their needs, their level of comfort, and individual choices will be starting to be present in our schools, which up until now we haven't had as much of because of the tight protocols. And we are gonna to need to really work together to make this an accepting environment of whatever choice people make, whether it's adults or students. I have high hopes that that's exactly what will happen because two years of this and we have seen nothing but a respectful environment, but we're certainly gonna, if we go forward with optional masking, we will be at a different place in terms of a, a wider range of individual choice and the respect we will need to offer for that. And then just, you know, the big asterisk that goes on every COVID discussion, if a surge returns, it could require a review of this decision. Uh, we're all hopeful that it wouldn't. We're all hopeful that Omicron helped us learn a lot about patterns of different variants and their level of transmissibility might not equate to the level of severity uh, so that would all have to be part of the discussion, which is why I'm not offering a metric tonight. If we'd been living by metrics, Omicron, we would have had no way to, to gauge the metrics we would have needed given the case counts that we've seen. And so similar mindset that rather than try to prescribe a condition, we will just all be very cognizant and responsive as we have been for almost two years now. So those are my recommendations tonight. I turn it over to the committee and let you talk among each other. And if you want to invite the health leaders, they are here as well. Please, yes, please. Uh, um, Trisha and, um, and Marsha, um, if you could, if you would like and to turn on your videos and your audio so we can have you as part of this. Hi, Trisha. Um, I don't oh. see, I saw Marsha early. There. Oh, there. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, is there anything that you have, would like to add to, um, to what Dr. Hunter said before we begin talking? Trisha, go ahead. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Nice to see you guys, everyone again. 
Um, so I am totally um, in agreement with Dr. Hunter's proposal. Um, I know um, in the Board of Health meeting that we just had, um, people were very anxious to drop the mask mandate in town, which of course they did effective immediately tonight. And there um, were a couple of community, community members that were hoping that we would drop it on the 28th as well in school. Um, and I guess we say drop it, but I think we really have to work on our language about being, being mask flexible. So um, if people choose to continue to wear their mask, that is perfectly okay, right? It's a risk mit mitigation tool, right? So um, at any rate, I think uh, the March 7th date is really um, makes sense to me. We can get a couple, we can get a week of testing in, a couple of pool tests and or home tests. And then March 7th, you know, it's, it's one more week. I know it sounds like a long time away, but I am totally in favor of that. Sudbury has picked March 7th for their town and schools. I think Lincoln will push that tomorrow night. Um, so I'm happy to say that I'm looking for a few things to do because the numbers are down. Um, so we're moving in the right direction. I'm really pleased. And Trisha, okay. if I could add to that, the reason that they cited for uh, lifting the mask mandate this evening um, as of midnight is due to the uh, case counts dropping dramatically, as well as the high vaccination rate amongst people who are able or eligible to be vaccinated. It was, it's 90.7%. Um, that does not include children under five and under, but um, of the, the remaining population, I think that is a significant number. And um, the board was split evenly, two to two, uh, going with the February 28th or February, or the March 7th date, um, citing the social and um, emotional toll that this has taken on children. So um, that's why the split was the way it was. Uh, two of the, the members were in full agreement with Trisha's position of giving it a week and allowing that additional testing to occur after people get back from vacation. So um, it is your decision, but their recommendation is one or the other. Thank you. To Marcia, to, just to be clear, I, I suppose it's obvious that two to two vote was in reference to a recommendation for the schools. Yes, correct. Thank you. Thank you. It was unanimous for lifting the mandate tonight for the town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, committee conversation. Do you have questions for for any of our guests or Dr. Hunter to start? Yep, Alexa. I just want to say to Trisha and Martha, Trisha has had many a conversation with me. I just want to say that for the last two years, we have been so fortunate to have this incredible collaboration with you, the Board of Health, um, Susan Rask before she retired. And I and I am so lifted by this consensus and the fact that we all have been really thoughtful um, these past two years. So again, I'm, I, I, this is mostly just an expression of gratitude for all that you have done to help guide us. And um, this feels very good to me at the end of the day. I like consensus and confidence and you have helped with that. So thank you guys both so much. Yeah. And, Trisha, and Trisha, could you pa pass along our thanks to the Board of Health for all the work? I know that they probably have very careful and thoughtful deliberations, and I know that this is a, it's a full-time job for them. So, um, and we look forward to collaborating, collaborating with them on other topics other than COVID going forward. So Thank thanks you. for that. Okay. Um, and if it's okay, if any, if, um, I need to get back to the Board of Health meetings. So. Okay. Thank you so much for, for, for coming. Have a good night. Thank you, Marsha. Patricia, we have, we have you for the, for the rest of the conversation. You Fantastic. do. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. One question. I don't have a position. Do we have a, a, a rule about visitors in mass? I, I'll handle that one. I guess my assumption was that this would pertain to everyone. Masks oh. being optional. 
Okay. If that's for you to discuss, I didn't propose anything specifically. And and the current policy references uh, anybody in the schools. That's the way we've administered it. Um, Laurie, I think it's a uh, a prudent uh, recommendation. Um, I think it's uh, going to be a, a long eight school days for the people who uh, are struggling with this. Um, we're going to, if this does go forward, uh, it's going to require a lot of a lot of patience and forbearance for that eight days. Uh, but I think. The, the payoff can be uh, can be wonderful if uh, we don't have a resurgence and uh, we can finish off the winter, not even wait till spring to uh, see this see this change occur. I have a preschool question. Um, is there any thoughts of collaborating with the other preschools in town to kind of see where all the preschools are at? um and also i talk with them often tracy they usually follow our lead just okay okay anecdotally anyway <laughs> yeah and then also um rec department will they be following our lead usually same anita might even be on the call i think she is on yes. the call actually yeah they usually all let us chart the course and then I guess I would just also have to say, um, while Trish is on and while you are here, all those vaccination clinics that many people on this call went to would not have happened without both of you. So I think just a public thank you and anyone who's on the call, feel free to send Trish a note. And if you've been contact Trace, you've probably already talked to her. So thank you again for all the extensive time really in, in getting us through this. You're welcome. Thanks everyone. Dr. Hunter, do you think that just for the during the conversation piece, could you screen share again your recommendations just in case there are specific um, things that we might need to to talk about? Um, because I know one question out there uh, just recently, MIA lifted the mask requirement for sports, and I think that that's something that I, I don't. It wasn't specifically referenced in your recommendations? No, again, I was assuming between the MIAA's recommendation and the fact that we've made our policies all global so far that the recommendation here would pertain. I think you could have some discussion over whether you wanted to be more aggressive aligned with MIAA um, because they've done it more quickly than the seventh. So that's that's an option. I did not get a chance to talk to Aaron Jonkis about the DCL um, going forward. It's going to be district by district as it has been, knowing MIA has set us a, a guideline. Um, as, as the newest member, I just wanna echo that I've been, I'm really encouraged by the broad consensus. I was really um, impressed to see all of the different pieces come together um, to really get to this point where um, the Board of Health, the school committee, um, everyone is really working together to make sure that we as a town are doing what's what's right. And um, I think it's, it's um, exciting to be at this moment. We've all waited for a really long time to get here. Um, I do have one question. We obviously there are a few people on the call who had some concerns about it. Are there um, and might ask their children to wear masks? You sort of talked about this in your comments, but are there any supports in place or any you know specific thoughts on how to support the kids whose families are requesting that they wear them, even though they might not want to themselves or or you know along those lines? Great question. So we would highly suggest that if you have concerns that you think your child will need support to make sure at the elementary school, the uh, elementary classroom teachers are aware. I know they're going to want to be supportive of both directions, whatever way families are, are opting. I think at the middle and high school, if there's particular needs, use the guidance teams to let them know that the child might need support or need a check in or are there any places during the day it's gonna be a little harder than others? I know there was one family that reached out to me this week and we set up an IEP team meeting because of the students' needs and wanting to be sure we were planning ahead. I think you know another benefit of the March 7th date is we do have eight school days to work through some of these decisions and supports for kids. 
I think t teachers are going to make their own decisions. I do believe there will be adults still masked throughout the schools, which I think will be a nice balance and set a nice tone of individual decision making and an opportunity for whatever direction you feel most comfortable. So communication is key to, to the transition as needed. I have a question, Lori. You and I had exchanged, I don't know, I think it was you who alerted me to a bill that had passed in the state house allocating a really large chunk of money, in fact, for N95 masks to be distributed at schools. Do you have you heard from the state about a timeline for that so that from an equity standpoint, we would be able to provide? those kind of highly protective materials to staff or students? Sure, so we haven't heard a timeline. That bill did pass the other day. So there is a lot of funding available for masks and ongoing testing. Uh, I, we are well supplied right now, Jared, right? With masks throughout the district. So any needs can easily be met and we will maintain our supplies. I think we're interested to watch decision-making at DESE and DPH in terms of recommendation for pooled testing versus antigen testing. Uh, right now we have both in place and whether that'll, that'll shift. Uh, it's great to see the funding is still going to be there so that you know some of the protocols we're all used to and have come to believe are important are still available. So no Alexa, not per se, other than the actual passage of the bill just a day or two ago. Dr. Hunter, quick question. Um, when it comes to uh, the lunch time at the high school, um, are we back to a normal capacity, normal setup of the tables? And we have been. Um, we have been for a while now, back to normal capacity and setup of tables. I'm not going to say it's perfect because some furniture is still not where it was two years ago, but the, the mindset is the same. We made that change also at the middle schools and we are evolving at the elementary schools. They've just been back in the cafeterias about a week. Um, they, they've had space still between kids and we're gonna start to move that forward as well so that they have a more normal environment at the typical cafeteria table. So we are evolving back to, to more normal settings. Thank you. I'm sure that students uh, appreciate that, that they can uh, sit at the tables with, with everybody else. Um, it has been uh, a very thoughtful process. Thank you for all the collaboration. And I know it was um, a lengthy process um, to, to get to the recommendations. Um, I know that the students are uh, definitely waiting for uh, the biggest prize <laughs> uh, for mm -hmm. Uh, the cooperation with um, what we have asked them uh, uh, through the two years of the uh, uh, adjusting to the pandemic, they were uh, speaking for high school students, they were absolutely great. Um, wearing masks, getting vaccinated, uh, getting tested, uh, uh, letting us know, uh, letting the nurses know if uh, they had any symptoms. So uh, it's been a community effort. Um, and I really want to applaud uh, the, the students for um, how great of a community they have built. Agreed, Eva, and I'll expand, expand that to all of, all of the schools and just the incredible cooperation we've had from, from kids and the support from their families. Uh, Lori, I'm not really clear on what we do for mass breaks at our various schools. And for those students who are still choosing to mask, are we still going to provide them with a break? It, it's been it's been different this year from last year with it being a little less formalized. They are uh, encouraged to go outside during uh, plas passing times, lunch. If they have a free period. They can pop outside. Uh, so it's been been looser and different. Um, we weren't allowed to structure it quite so much in the schedules at the higher levels because of our required time on learning needs. So I think that will continue and the messaging will be clear to kids that those options are still available to them. Great.
Lori, can you speak a little bit more to the preschool recommendation? Um, since the vaccine has currently been delayed um, even further, can you elaborate a little bit more on um, what that might look like? Yes, so I did talk with a number of of people about the preschool where the students aren't all vaccinated, Trisha being one. Uh, Dr. Simons, our district uh, physician, and we connected with her as well, as well as through the preschool staff and got a sense of their feelings and looked at some of our, our case numbers. So until they're vaccinated, we'd like to hold off and leave them masks. We're hoping that's not too long. I suspect it'll be a little longer than we thought, but hopefully it's within the next month or so. And once we see, I don't know if that 80% number is the magic number, we, but it's the number we've been using. Um, if we can get to 80%, that's a really clear indication of unmasking. We're gonna watch it closely and see how the numbers evolve. Uh, I think it'll be revisited regularly because we want them unmasked as quickly as possible while we minimize the risk. Interesting, before Omicron, we had almost no preschool cases. Omicron mm -hmm. did change that a little bit with kids starting to actually get go, become positive, very mild illness, but um, we did actually see more cases in the preschool than we had seen all through the pandemic. So we're just being mindful of that. If we watch and there's very few cases throughout um, simultaneously with the vaccination rates, we'll bring you a recommendation hopefully sooner than later. And when you say watching the cases, do you mean town cases or watching the numbers? No, like when vaccine, I say that, I always mean numbers, the, local, the, the ones in the numbers. classrooms. Yeah, <laughs> the, the ones right in our classrooms and um, what kind of positive cases we're getting there, either through symptomatic or pool testing okay. and when you bring you those numbers. Can I just go back to the preschool for one second? Would there be an option for, you know, if there was, because it is an integrated preschool, for speech service to be delivered unmasked in a larger room, like are there um, possibilities for that, or some yeah. of like, pre-reading instruction to happen, you know, outside, or as the weather gets nicer? Yeah, so they're already doing some of that. Certainly outside, they've been using all through this school year as we unmasked outside back last spring. Uh, so we're using different kinds of plexiglasses and clear masks and spacing. So I, I'm confident that we're accommodating that right now. Um, am I going to say we're taking the mask all the way off? That's probably not consistent at this point, depending on the, the adult that's involved. But they've been really working to make sure those kids are getting access to the services they need in the most effective way. And we'll keep talking with them now that we're in this next phase, we can have that discussion with them more individually. All right. Um. There are no more questions or comments from school committee members. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Um, uh, we will return to our additional public comment time right now. Um, so if you are in the public and you wish to make a comment, please use the participants tab to raise your hand. Todd Benjamin, I will recognize you again, but I will note that you have spoken once. So I'm going to give you one minute instead of the three that you've got. Thank you. Okay, thanks. No problem. I can uh, I can talk quickly. I uh, jumped over to the Board of Health meeting um, this evening and, and listened in while they were discussing this. And as was mentioned, um, there was a, a split vote in, in terms of the recommendation to rescind the mask mandate for the schools. But I think what is informative here is that the two healthcare professionals on the Board of Health are the ones who said it should be rescinded on February 28th. One of those healthcare um, professionals, um, Dr. Green, mentioned the toll that this is taking on kids' health, on their mental health. And she was saying how she sees this daily or at least frequently in her experience as a doctor uh, at Emerson Hospital. So we might say, well, what difference does it make if it's uh, March 7th or February 28th? The healthcare professionals in our community who are on our board of health are saying that it makes a difference and that we should end this mask mandate for our school children as soon as we can. Now, maybe midnight tonight, like the mask mandate is ending in the town is a little bit too fast, but we should certainly be able and be willing to do it on February 28th for the 
health and the mental health of our kids. So please end the mask mandate on February 28th or sooner. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne, please state your name and address. Hi, I'm Joanne Toronto. I live at 8 Crabtree Road in Concord. Um, I am not in favor of keeping the preschool masked. Um, these are the population of kids. Um, I know we're talking about social and emotional toll, but these are the population of kids that need language development. They need to learn social cues, facial interactions. I, I have a four-year-old. I really think that the mask is not needed at the preschool level. I understand that the vaccine is not available for those kids, but I do understand that they're low risk. And I think that was discussed at the Board of Health meeting as well, that the, you know, these younger kids are not at high risk of serious disease. Um, Dr. Hunter did also mention that she felt um, that there were very few cases at the preschool, you know, pre-Omicron, and then the cases that did present themselves were very mild in nature. So I don't see why we are going to be splitting up our kids, especially for the families that, you know, have kids that are in preschool and in some of the other schools in town. It doesn't make sense to me that the preschool kids are going to be in, the, in town with people who are not wearing masks. Nobody is going to be wearing a mask if they don't want to. And I really feel that it should be the parent's choice about whether or not their preschooler wears a mask to school. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other additional comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, we can proceed to the action item. Uh, action items. One, the first to vote to approve the 2022-23 school calendar. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Discussion? Well, we, we know that the calendar seems to magically appear, but actually uh, teachers, administrators, school committee, others sat down with this and spent a good amount of time on it. Um, so thanks to those folks. Okay. Roll call. Anderson, I for both. Who's I for both? Murano, I for both. Mustafa, I for region. Brady, I for both. Rankin, I for both. And Wilson for region. Thank you. And a vote to rescind the uh, face covering policy. Um, is there a motion? I move that the school committee rescind policy EBCFA face coverings, effective March 7, 2022, and authorize the superintendent of schools, Dr. Hunter, to implement the recommendations uh, that she presented tonight. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Discussion. I'll say what I said before. We know this is going to be painful for some folks. And uh, I think my colleagues tonight will join me in saying, uh, uh, please do hang in there. Um, thank you. We know it's going to be difficult um, for some members of our community, um, and uh, we, we are sensitive to that, although tonight's vote might appear otherwise. If we can continue to look at the preschoolers, maybe at every school committee meeting, and just really keep close eyes on that. Well, I think we should continue to keep close eyes on the whole Yep. Happen, right it, it's not over no we just, well, yeah. we're not we're not talking we're still going to continue our checking in on all of the covid policies no. practice protocols recommendations and and all of that um at every meeting i'm I, i'm going to guess tracy you're well aware of that and you're asking for special attention to that group yep. that yes actually got yes. special attention tonight as well yes because they were because in dr hunter's recommendation they were called out so i just think that it's important in our discussions to continue to specifically talk about the preschool population because i do think it is difficult um for our youngest kids to be in masks and um they 
you know, and especially when you have children on IEPs and, you know, trying to acquire language skills and, and all of that. So I just would like special attention paid to the preschool. Well, well, I'm sure that, our, you know, school physician and Tricia will continue to advise Dr. Hunter and whether that should change. Um, I also just want to add that the EEC will be coming out with recommendations regarding masking of this age group shortly. I've been pushing, pushing, pushing because a lot of the preschools and daycares have been asking. So I will be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? No. All right, we will uh, then, I think we can take a roll call. Yeah. Anderson, I for both. Who's I for both? Murano, I for both. Mustafi, I for region. Randy, I for both. Rankin, I for both. Uh, Wilson for region. Uh, many thanks, Dr. Hunter, for putting forward this uh, recommendation that is I suppose too fast for some and, too, and, and, and not fast enough for others, um, but I think it is a, it's a prudent and well thought out plan. Thank you, Tricia, for, for consulting with her and for, for all your work with the Board of Health, with the schools. Um, I think it's important that we have healthcare professionals like you that we can l listen to and lean on. And, uh, and uh, we really value all of all the knowledge that you bring to us and, uh, and your attention to, to our community. So thank you. Sarah, I just thank the community, the, their attention and collaboration and <laughs> engagement this week has been really notable, whether it was emails or a hundred people on the school committee meeting here tonight. I, it just feels like that same community-wide effort that has been in place and here we go into the next phase together. So just grateful for that. And thank can I just you. add one thank you to all the town, the school staff, the nurses and school staff, the amazing work that they have been doing. You know, the first year I was doing most of the case management and contact tracing. And then those teachers have just taken care of their own this last year. They have been amazing. They're going to put me out of a job. Um, so a shout out to them. <laughs> really a great collaborative effort because, yeah. you know, during this surge, it wasn't just one person really helpful. So they went above and beyond. So I thank them. Yeah, and of course, thank you to the teachers, the staff, the custodians, the bus drivers, front office staff. And I know I'm forgetting somebody, but you know, they're you're the heroes. And I know you've been doing amazing things. And uh, so it's it's we still got a lot of the year to go. Um, and I look forward to seeing more of you in person. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn the regional part of this meeting and leave Concord in session. Any motion? Don't move. <laughs> <laughs> so like to make it. I was going to make it, sorry. <laughs> Is there a I'll second? second it. Okay, great. Roll call. Anderson, aye. Who's aye? Marana, aye. Mustafi, aye. Randy, aye. Frank and I. And Wilson, I. Have a good night, Carla. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye, guys. So the Congress School Committee remains in session. And our first topic is the FY23 budget. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Hunter and Mr. Stanton. Great. Thank you. So as you look at this, we wanted to bring you a status update as to where we are with the numbers and the finance committee. So if we look at the current totals, we are, we are coming in still at a $350,000 difference between the finance committee guideline and the current recommended budget. We've been back through the budget again, through the zero based backup documents that we have really look to see where else we could trim. I think it was worth noting some of the patterns that are present in the budget as it exists currently and why it was hard to find a lot more places we were comfortable trimming. 
And that is very much because we have taken risks in other spots to get to the number that we're at. So we've assumed some attrition in personnel through retirements or resignations, some of which have happened and some of which still may have not happened. So we're cautious and uh, don't wanna go too much deeper there. The unknown of the kindergarten enrollment numbers, those are coming into us now. It's only February, so it's very hard to know how accurate they are. They're low right now, but that's, and that's been the pattern. We do expect them to be on par with the past couple of years, but there's some unknowns there. And we did, we did take some calculated, uh, I don't want to say, keep saying the word risk, <laughs> educated decision-making that may or may not be perfect. So we wanted to just bring that to your attention. Special education tuitions, we've really budgeted a zero-based process there without any contingency. So we want to just note that there's some risk taking there. We can go to circuit breaker. So when I say no contingency, I'm not including circuit breaker, which is available to us, but there isn't any buffer in the line item itself. We did reduce supply and materials during the budget build. We have just had an experience of how COVID's impacted our inventories, our needs, and have reduced those back to a bit below where they were uh, pre-pandemic. So given all of that, we were able to identify one unexpected resignation that we feel we could bring to you because it wasn't on the radar at all. And that would be a savings, and that's a known fact that that is happening. So we wanted to suggest we could reduce my recommended budget number to you by $37,846. So there is a revised recommendation there for the total amount, which reduces the delta between the budget recommendation and the guideline down to $312,000. The other thing I think really of note, and these are beyond us decision-making in this group, but important to state, when we last revisited the high school budget, we reduced another 174,000 based on the unanticipated revenue that we received from the state. And we are coming in under the guideline that was the uh, permanent guideline issued by the, by the finance committee. They have not met since that discussion, so they will have the $174,000 available to them. We would ask and hope that they would apply that to the CPS budget for their consideration, in which case, if they were to do that, the difference between the 312 and the 174 is about 138,000, which is a much closer number than where we started last time we met with the finance committee. So my recommendation is to lower the number by that 37,000 and then let's, let's let the finance committee revisit where the movement we've made and wait to see what their decision making is later this month. All right. Any comments or questions regarding the memo? It appears very clear to me. Um, I would prefer not to revote the budget um, because we're still working on the budget, but certainly bring this forward um, as really, really solid information that uh, Dr. Hunter and Mr. Stanton have put together um, for us and in turn for the finance committees. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Great. On our final agenda item is the middle school building project status. Who wants to take on the? Uh... Well, we're 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 very happy. <laughs> let's start. <laughs> let's start there. Uh, Dr. Hunter, you've uh, put put in more uh, inspiration and perspiration than the rest <laughs> of us, perhaps. Do you want to speak to what we're doing this week? Sure. Sure. We're getting, getting into the next phase here. So we have a meeting on Thursday morning. We are expecting the design and OPM teams to bring us a schedule, which I have not seen yet. So I can't give you the details of that. Um, we are excited to get to the design development phase and start to take a look at each space in a closer way. I know they've asked to also get some uh, traffic studies up and running. They're gonna need to do borings. 
we had pushed off the borings. They're going to be pretty disruptive at Sanborn, but welcome to construction, right? So now we'll make those work and really start to see this project accelerate into the, into what's next. So it's I my agree, Court. It's really exciting um, to think we're going to really start to design where kids will be and where they're going to learn and what that's going to look like. And I'm excited to see the schedule and process they're going to lay out for us on Thursday. Great. Yeah, so that's a that's a public meeting 730 in the morning and uh, posted on the town website and links on the school website. Yes. Great. Any other questions, comments about the building project? All right. Well, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> I had to jump in there. Can I get a second? <laughs> I'll second it. Oh, thank you. Roll call, please. Anderson, I. Who's I? Murano, I. Rainy, I. Frank, and I. Very good. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.